नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू सी सी गुरुकुल लेक्चर्स आई एम डॉक्टर कुमार शांतनु एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर ऑफ बॉटनी फ्रॉम देशबंधु कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली सो टिल नाउ सो फार वी हैव कवर्ड द मॉर्फोलॉजिकल एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ साइकस एंड वी शैल बी कंटिन्यूइंग आर डिस्कशन फ्रॉम द एनाटमी ऑफ वेरियस Uh, parts of psychus uh, in this lecture we shall continue our discussion from the previous lecture that is the anatomy of psychus where we have seen the anatomy of stem so far let us understand the anatomy of leaf now the leaf has a long rachis the rachis is cylindrical and bears leaflets inserted on the adaxial side this makes the outline appear like a shield a single layered epidermis is thick walled and covered by a thick cuticle except in the region of stomata the stomatal apparatus has the sunken stomatal pore pair of guard cells pair of subsidiary cells and a pair of encircling cells forming an overarching ring the guard cells are lined on the outer side of uh, on the outer side by the presence of ventral and lateral lignin laminae below the epidermis lies the hypodermis which is 2 to 3 layered on the adaxial side and many layered on the abaxial surface it consists of a mixture of sclerenchyma and colenchyma followed by parenchymatous ground tissue in which are interspersed several collateral open vascular bundles these vascular bundles are arranged in an arc that appears like a u with arms or like the inverted greek letter omega the mucilage canals are present both on the inside and outside of the vascular arc we can understand this structure with the help of this diagram where you can see that the ts of rachis it has a large abaxial side and a small adaxial side in this large abaxial side the vascular bundles are present in an inverted omega shaped arrangement the rachis ts has an epidermis on the outermost side followed by few cell thick hypodermis and then there is a parenchymatous ground tissue in this parenchymatous cortex or ground tissue multiple vascular bundles are arranged each vascular bundle they have conjoint xylem in the lower side they have phloem tissue in between xylem and phloem tissue is present cambial tissues the protoxylem is towards inside and this vascular bundle is surrounded by a pericycle the vascular bundle of the rachis exhibits an intriguing behavior the vascular bundle show typical mesarch arrangement when the trans transverse section is cut from the region of rachis which is slightly higher than the leaf base there is a variation in the arrangement of xylem tracheids at different heights of the rachis at the base of the rachis the bundles are endarch or centrifugal that is the protoxylem towards the center and metaxylem towards the outside the vascular bundle as they enter the leaf split into a number of strands and get arranged in the form of an inverted omega at this level the xylem elements remain entirely endarch 
or centrifugal. In the other arrangement, after traversing some distance upwards in the rachis, the centripetal xylem elements develop on the inner side of the protoxylem and thus protoxylem is positioned between the centripetal and centrifugal metaxylem suggesting pseudo mesar conditions and subsequently uh, formation of centrifugal is reduced gradually on moving towards the tip. Therefore, near the tip of the rachis, the centripetal xylem is more abundant than the centrifugal xylem. Also, the number of bundles gets reduced and become arranged in a, uh, in a C shaped arc. These peculiar diploxylic vascular bundles having both the centripetal as well as the centrifugal xylem are also termed as pseudomonarch. As the bundles move further into the leaflets, they become exarch with no traces of centrifugal xylem. Such arrangements can be understood with the help of this diagram. This diagram shows a TS of rachis and this is a cellular diagram with different types of variation in the vascular bundles at different heights of the rachis. Here you can see stomatal complex which has a stomatal pore, a sunken stomata which contains guard cells on both the ends flanked by subsidiary cells. Above these hypodermal cells are found the ground tissues or the parenchymatous tissues and in these parenchymatous tissues these vascular bundles are arranged. In case of cycus revoluta, the margin of the wings is curved inwards or revolute. The entire leaf of cycus exhibits a number of xerophytic characters. It is leathery and thickly cutinated. Each leaflet is dorsiventral and the single layered epidermis comprises of thick walled cuticularized cells with simple pits. The stomata are present only on lower sides that means they are hypostomatic and they are restricted to wing regions only. The hypodermis is one or two layered in the wing region and its cells are also cutinized and lignified. Uh, a schematic diagram of cross section of a leaflet is shown here where you can see the outermost layer of cuticle followed by a single layer of epidermis. Below the epidermis is found hypodermis and below the hypodermis chlorenchymatous tissues are found which are elongated also termed as pellicid layer. On the lower side or on the lower surface the epidermis is interrupted by the presence of stoma and the central midrib portion contains a vascular bundle. The mesophyll is differentiated into a single layered pellicid and multi layered spongy parenchyma. The pellicid cells may be continuous in the midrib region for example in case of cycus revoluta or it may be discontinuous as the case is found in cycus circinalis or cycus rumphi. Palisade cells contain abundant chloroplasts. The vascular bundle is conjoint, collateral, open and diploxylic. We can also see isolated thick walled cells extending from it to the hypodermal cells. These cells are arranged at the right angles to the longitudinal axis of the leaf and are present from midrib till the margin of the leaflet. These are design, designated as accessory transfusion tissue and function as lateral conducting tissues. The endodermis is single layered and sclerenchymatous which encloses vascular bundles. Phloem comprises of sieve tubes and phloem 
parenchyma. Now let us talk about root and its anatomy. As we have already discussed, roots are of two types in case of cycas. One is called as the normal root and the other one is called as the corolloid root. The anatomy of a young normal root of cycas resembles to that of a dicotyledonous root in its internal structure. If we go through the transverse section of a normal root in case of cycas, we will see that the outermost layer is termed as epiblema, which is followed by cortical tissues. Cortical tissues are compact loosely arranged uh, compact tissues. In the center of cortex, endodermis encloses the entire vascular bundle. The vascular bundle possesses secondary xylem, the phloem tissues and in between these phloem tissues, xylem and metaxylem tissues are found. These xylem and metaxylem tissues are primary xylem where the protoxylum is towards the periphery and metaxylum is towards the center and such conditions are also termed as the exact conditions. We can find other columns of xylem also which are the resultant of secondary growth and these are also termed as secondary xylem. The outermost layer of the root is also termed as epidermis. In case of root, they are also termed as epiblema. It develops root hairs behind the growing apex as in other roots. Next to the epidermis lies the cortex which is several layered and consists of parenchymatous cells with abundant starch grains. Sporadically sclerenchymatous cells and tannin filled cells are diffused in the cortical region. In addition, Cells containing variously shaped crystals are also commonly seen distributed in the cortex. Next to it is a single layered endodermis. Endodermal cells are characterized by Casparian thickenings. Inner to endodermis is a pericycle which is often multilayered. It is made up of thin walled cells with abundant starch grains. The xylem and phloem are radially arranged. The vasculature varies from diarch to triarch to polyarc conditions and the protoxylum is always exarch. The xylem comprises of tracheids and lac vessels. The center of root may be occupied by small parenchymatous spit or it may be occupied by metaxylem elements. An inner periderm often differentiates in the pericyclic region. Secondary growth begins with the development of arcs of cambium on the inner side of the phloem. The pericycle lies in between these arcs to become meristematic and join the arcs of cambium to form a complete cambial ring. The activity of the cambial ring generates the secondary xylem towards inside and secondary phloem towards outside. Now, anatomically, the corolloid root is quite similar to the normal root except that it has a wider cortex with a very well-defined algal zone almost in the middle of the large intercellular spaces. This zone consists of thin-walled radially elongated cells that are loosely arranged having large intercellular spaces occupied by various algal and bacterial species such as Eulothrix, Chlorococcus, Calothrix, etc. The cortex consists of parenchymatous cells, the phylogen that is the cork cambium and a few layers of cork cells are present on the periphery. This can be very well uh, understood with the help of this diagram where you can see that the TS of a colloid root bears an outermost epidermis. In case of root, the epidermis is also termed as epiblema. Below the epidermis is this entire cortex. These cortical cells 
are very wide in case of coralloid root and almost in the middle region of cortex we find some elongated cells infested with algal cells these elongated cells they uh, host these symbiotic alga and because of the presence of this layer the cortex can be distinguished into three regions the outer cortex the middle band and the inner cortex the inner cortex has mucilage and tenin cells interspersed irregularly and in the center we have a single layer of endodermis below this endodermis we find xylem and phloem tissues in the center we may encounter pith cells the xylem and phloem they are found alternating each other the cambial cells in between xylem and phloem sometimes divide and uh, the secondary growth is very rarely seen in coralloid roots the other two minor differences uh, which include between the normal root and the coralloid root they are the xylem usually is triarch or tetrarch in case of coralloid root the secondary growth is very limited the lenticels are very much profound and abundant in coralloid roots and the vascular tissues are poorly developed as compared to the vascular bundles or vascular tissues of normal roots now let us talk about the reproduction in case of cycas the reproduction in cycas takes place by means of vegetative and sexual methods vegetative reproduction takes place by means of bulbils which develop in the crevices of the scales when detached uh, help in vegetative propagation each bulbil possesses few scales and foliage leaves as far as the the sexual reproduction is concerned cycads are di uh, dioecious that means the male and female reproductive structures are born on separate plants the male plants possess sympodial or false axis because the growing apex of male plant is exhausted in the development of male cones on the contrary female plant has monopodial or true axis due to the persistent growing apex and it continues to produce foliage leaves and scale leaves and alternating them with a set of megasporophylls generally only a single set of megasporophylls is produced every year the cycas plants undergo vegetative growth for about 10 years and then start bearing their reproductive structures one cannot distinguish between the two sexes until the plants have born the male and female reproductive structures even the bulbils meant for vegetative propagation mature into the plants of the same sex as the parents now let us talk about the male cone and gametophyte the male cone is large in size oval or conical in shape and mostly develops singly in the center of the crown fenced by scale leaves the surface of young cone is enveloped totally by brown scales the mature cone in uh, emanates a strong characteristic odor that can be smelled even from a distance here uh, the picture shows a very well developed male cone a male cone is developed in the center of the crown of the leaves after the formation of male cone the central axis is almost consumed and these male cone they have microsporophylls very compactly arranged in a uh, circular fashion over a central axis the male cone has a central axis on which 
microsporophylls are almost perpendicular attached and are arranged in a spiral fashion. Each microsporophyll is a hard horizontal flattened woody structure consisting of a wedge shaped portion with a tapering upcurved tip and apophysis. The large number of sporangia are born on the abaxial surface and these are clustered together in the group of 3, 4 or 5 to form sori. Each sorus is enclosed by single celled sorrel hairs. Every mature sporangium is an oval sac with a massive stalk and dehysis by a longitudinal slit that forms on the wall. About 700 sporangia per sporophyll are found in Cycus circinalis and there are around 160 in Cycus media. Each sporangium bears numerous pollen grains. This diagram shows a microsporophyll in an enlarged view. The microsp these are the microsporangia which are attached on the abaxial surface of microsporophyll and the extended part of the microsporophyll is also termed as apophysis. In a transverse section this microsporophyll will occur triangular in structure in outline and on the lower surface microsporangia are found each microsporangium would bear microspores these microspores represent male gametophyte in case of cycus so as discussed above the male cones are terminal in position but form the base of the peduncle arises a lateral bud that continues to grow as apex and pushes the cone to one side the new shoot apex thus formed soon produces a crown of leaves and scales and ultimately bears another male cone. This type of growth is termed as sympodial growth. The microspores or the pollen grains develop from microspore mother cell as a result of microsporogenesis. The microspore mother cell is diploid and represents the late stage in sporophyte generation. These diploid cells undergo reduction division resulting in the formation of tetrad of haploid microspores. The latter represents the first stage of uh, male gametophyte generation. The wall of uninucleate pollen grain is two-layered, the outer thick exine and inner thin entine. The pollen grain starts germinating within microsporangium and forms a small prothelial cells and a large central cell. The former cell does not divide and remains attached to the lower region while the later divides to form a small genitive cell and a large tube cell. As far as the female strobilus and gametophyte is concerned, the genus Cycus is unique amongst other cycads in not having a compact female cone but has a set of loosely arranged megasporophylls. The female plant bears successively the foliage leaves, cataphylls and then megasporophylls. Uh, here there is a picture of uh, foliage leaves, then scaly leaves, cataphylls and in the center there is a crown of megasporophylls. So, these megasporophylls, uh, this sequence keeps on repeating uh, during the development of megasporophylls. Each megasporophyll is a modified leaf-like structure and possess a ratchet-like part covered with yellow hairs and bearing two rows of ovules on the lateral side. The terminal region of the megasporophyll has pinnate segments. You can see this pinnate segment. Uh, very clearly in this diagram where the central portion will gradually uh, there is a arrangement of these megasporophylls and in the center the apex will keep on growing and later they will give rise to the other types of leaves. Each megasporophyll is about 
30 centimeter or more in length and it bears 2 to 12 ovules arranged in two rows. The ovules are orthotropous, short stalked and they are either oppositely or sub oppositely arranged. Cycus is known to produce the largest ovules in the plant kingdom ranging 6 to 7 centimeter in length. In a young ovule, a distinct megaspore mother cell is seen. It undergoes meiosis to form a linear tetrad of megaspores of which only the lowermost is functional. This undergoes a series of mitotic division to first form a free nuclear female gametophyte which eventually becomes cellular. Later on, centripetal wall formation takes place forming a cellular endosperm or the female gametophyte. Formation of archegonia begins soon after the gametophyte becomes cellular. In cycus and other gymnosperms, the endosperm is developed in continuation of the development of female gametophyte and is therefore haploid and a pre-fertilization structure. As the female gametophyte develops, the micropylar surface of the gametophyte which bears archegonia separates from the covering cells to form a depression in the middle called as archegonial chamber. The mature archegonium has a neck made up of single tire of two cells. There are no neck canal cells and the ventral canal nucleus also degenerates. The egg nucleus is very large in cycus revoluta and it is visible to unaided eyes also. It takes about two to three months for the archegonia to mature. The maturation of different archegonia in a gametophyte is synchronous. Now, as far as pollination, fertilization and embryogeny is concerned, once male and female gametophytes have developed, it is necessary to bring these two together in close proximity through pollination so as to promote fertilization for, for, for further progression. The pollen grains are three celled at the time of pollination and they are carried to the female plants by means of wind or insects. At this stage, some of the new cellular cells degenerate forming a pollen chamber and a pollination drop is secreted at the tip of the ovule. A number of pollen grains are caught in this liquid and are subsequently sucked in through the micropyle to the pollen chamber. The pollen chamber is then sealed from the outside world to prevent invasion by pathogens and to provide a favorable environment to the developing embryo. Concurrently, the pollen grain germinates to form a pollen tube at the end opposite to the prothallial cell. The pollen tube expands sideways towards the nucellus to serve hostarium by absorbing nutrition from it. Anthridial cell divides into stalk and spermatogenous cells. The spermatogenous cells enlarges and elongates along the longitudinal axis of the pollen grain. Its nucleus also enlarges and two blepharoblasts appear at two poles of the nucleus. Two sperms are formed by the division of spermatogenous cell. The continued growth of the hostorial pollen tube leads to the degeneration of the new cellular tissue. The spermatozoites of cycads are the largest male gametes of the plant kingdom and can be seen with naked eyes. The sperms are inverted pear shaped and have a spiral band which makes six turns on the body and appears star like in a radial section and to it the flagella are attached. The sperms are released in the archegonial chamber from the pollen grain through tubular growth on the side of the prothallial cell. The male nucleus penetrates deep into the large egg nucleus before its membrane disappears. It eventually sheds off its flagellar band and its nucleus approaches the egg and shrinks into it. This marks the completion of fertilization and zygote is the outcome of this process. Uh, the fertilization with the help of ciliate sperm is called as zoidogamy. Usually wherever zoidogamy exists, the motile sperms always swim 
in the external water. But in cycas where spermatozoids are motile, nonetheless they never get a chance to swim in external water. Hence, zoidogamy is non-functional in cycas and is only present as a remnant of its former aquatic ancestor. Additionally, cycas also exhibits phenomenon of siphonogamy that is pollen tube formation for the transport of male cells to the egg cells. However, in case of uh, cycas, the function of pollen tube is hostorial and not as carrier of sperms. Therefore, in cycas, siphonogamy is also non-functional. This suggests that cycas is a link between pteridophytes and the gymnosperms. So, this is how we have uh, seen how the fertilization is also taking place. Once the fertilization takes place, uh, the two uh, uh, male and female gametes, uh, the fuse and the zygote and embryo is formed and from this embryo, the seeds uh, are produced by that outer covering and these seeds will be germinated when the favorable condition arrives. So, this is how the entire life cycle gets completed in case of cycles. I hope I have uh, been able to cover entire life cycle in this short span of time uh, and uh, I have been able to deliver all these concepts in a very amicable way. Thank you so much for your patient listening.